Okay, good day, good day, good evening. My folks in Western New York, can you hear us? Okay, um, I'm assuming that we can be heard in Western New York. If so, please raise your hand. Yes, you should. Oh, and don't you all look lovely? <laughs> all right, well, uh, good day. My name is Valerie White and welcome. Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining our Women's History Month webinar, Women Leading in Real Estate and Development. Hello, Tyra, how are you? Good to see you. We're so excited to be able to do this across the state. And uh, this, I think this is the first time we've had two events going on in our two uh, markets and we were able to be connective in this particular topic, which is very uh, important to us. So again, my name is Valerie White. I'm executive director of List New York. And we are absolutely thrilled to host this conversation on women in real estate. And on behalf of List New York and our team, I wanna thank uh, our phenomenal panelists. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, uh, for joining us and taking the time to share your insights and knowledge about women in real estate and development with us today. I want to talk briefly about List New York and our commitment to increasing and advancing women in the real estate industry. Now, as you have probably heard, not only are developers of color underrepresented in the real estate industry across New York, but historically, and contemporary inequities make it harder to grow their businesses. The racial wealth gap and exclusion from past development opportunities means that many developers are challenged by balance sheet and collateral requirements imposed by tra traditional commercial lenders. Technical assistance and support networks, fundamental components both of organizations organizational success and are more challenging to access for entrepreneurs of color and for funding of such efforts are often inadequate. So to address this, we at List New York formed the Developers of Color training program to help developers of color enhance their networks, gain access to capital and build their capacity to expand their existing portfolio of business and contracts. This supports a more inclusive and equitable wealth generation. List New York is dedicated to investing in communities and minority women-owned businesses. Our investment strategy is guided by our three pillars. The first is radical healing, and that counters racial biases and inequities. And that includes, uh, we do that through community and safety creative placemaking in the arts and initiatives, and of course, our very active ag advocacy and policy platform. The second pillar is our inclusive economic transformation that prioritizes human talent, community health, diverse enterprises, innovation, and public infrastructure. And that is where we invest quite a bit of our capital. The third is sustainable wealth generations in communities of color. And we do that through ownership asset building and career ladders. And the Developers of Color program sits very squarely in that uh, pillar as we help to move developers to um, access uh, of wealth attainment and uh, access to capital and gaining opportunity. At List New York, we believe that the time has come to forge a future for New York that eradicates the racial wealth gap for goods, and protects affordable housing for low to moderate income New Yorkers and builds pathways of meaningful economic opportunity for all. Women like those that you will hear from today play a huge role in making these goals happen. I would now like to pass things over to Tyra Johnson, Tyra Hooks Johnson, right? And our Western New York office um, for some framing remarks about the importance of women in real estate development and the next step of today's event. So thank you all for coming and I will now turn this over to Tyra. Thank you, Valerie. I'm so 
hoping that you can hear me. I have a lapel mic on and it sounds like it's working, correct? I can't tell. Valerie, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me on your end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to all of our friends down in New York City. Welcome to all of our friends here in the Western New York area uh, from both Buffalo and Niagara Falls and maybe beyond. Um, we have a great panel for you today, but before we start, I just want to talk a little bit about women in real estate. So I did a little bit of digging and I was trying to figure out, you know, really what percentage of, of women uh, make up the workforce in real estate development. I couldn't find the straight facts, but I saw about a third of the development industry has women in the workforce. So about 32, 33%. But with that number, a lot of that number is made up by women that are doing uh, residential transactions. So buying and selling um, residential homes. Uh, so that means that there's not a lot of women that are doing larger commercial projects, larger development projects. So that's why it's really important for us to have um, convenings like we're having today. Um, when you look at Western New York's numbers at a glance, as I know all the people in our Western New York audience knows, there's not a lot of women at the head of these multi-million dollar projects that we see going on, um, either it, whether it be commercial or, or residential. And it's very clear that it's a male-dominated industry in Western New York. Um, and so when it comes to nailing down those deals, uh, making sure the financing is together, making sure those teams are together, unfortunately, we still just don't see a lot of women at that home. And so, um, as women that are at that table, we need to set that table for other women, right? So that's what we're here doing today. We have three dynamic women in real estate development. Uh, these are executive level uh, developers, and I'm proud to say that. Uh, they had already acted as mentors and role models uh, in the development world, but I think it's great that we're able to gain more insight from, the, from them today. Um, you know, events such as this is a great place to uh, expand your, your network, uh, learn from experts, learn from your peers. I think that's important because we should be learning from our peers as well as uh, the experts. Mentors, uh, trying to gather mentor, trying to figure out how you can get sponsors that can give you information and guidance. It's really important for us to have more of these events, and I'm so glad that we're able to now. Um, and I want to say one thing before I stop talking and give the mic to somebody else, is that if you don't remember anything else today, I want you to remember this. I want you to think of your network as a living, breathing ecosystem, right? It requires engagement and nurturing to maintain it and to grow it. So continue the engagement, continue with the nurturing, even after this event, we hope to hear from you more and more. And with that said, let me pass the mic to our first panelist, Ms. Jen Kaminsky, and we're gonna try this microphone. Hopefully we won't hear any feedback and we can pass this to you. So okay. if you could just give us a short bio. Sure, hi, um, can people hear me? Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Jen Kaminsky, and so I am, my current role is I am a housing development consultant with a group called MM Development Advisors. We are a um, own and own WDE um, housing development consulting group um, based in Rochester, but I'm based in Buffalo. And so I work with uh, nonprofit and mission based developers in all New York State to build supportive and housing. I started my career many years ago, primarily in the affordable housing sector in Boston, uh, working for a nonprofit community, the Development Corporation in DC, moved to New York, New York, back to New York City, where I grew up, um, worked for an organization called You Have, the Urban Standing Assistance Board, where I worked with um, residents in tax foreclosed buildings to create shared equity cooperatives. And then in 2012, moved to Buffalo where I was the director of planning and community development at Push Buffalo, um, working on all their various affordable housing and community development efforts. And then uh, for the last few years, I've been in the consulting world. So now I'm working still in Buffalo, but also across New York State, 
like right now I have projects from Niagara Falls going all the way down to Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and kind of everywhere in between. So that that is me. Wow. It's a hard act to follow, Gina. That <laughs> <laughs> is rather scary. No. <laughs> you, <laughs> think you're gonna, you two run orga major organizations. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Gina Beam, and I'm the executive director for Niagara Area Habitat for Humanity. And I've been in this role almost five years. Um, I've been in the nonprofit development world for 20, um, but this is my first role in housing development. And um, when I was in nonprofits, um, other nonprofits, I, I have done capital campaigns for the St. Louis Contemporary Art Museum, as well as the Birchfield Penny Art Museum. And I've worked with organizations such as Girl Scouts of Western New York. Yeah. Yes. Again, thank you for having us. Trim leader. <laughs> I think it's important, you know, just to start young and to really, you know, provide a female role, role model for your younger generations and for my daughter who's here tonight. Um, but yes, I, I mainly we work in Niagara Falls and North Tonawanda. And we we are starting, besides doing the um building of homes, uh, we're starting a critical home repair program and an aging in place program. Um, there's a lot of older housing stock in the area that people need a lot of help um, with being able to stay and make their house livable for longer. Another hard act to follow. <laughs> oh, great, and I had to go last. Hi, I'm Chandra Redfern, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Buffalo Federation of Neighborhood Centers. And so my story is a little different. I kind of got thrown into development. Um, I'm a counselor by trade, and I've been in the social service industry for over, we'll say over 20 years. <laughs> okay, 20 years. <laughs> and um, throughout my work, um, one of the, th the issues that we always come across is housing for people, right? And um, how do you find people housing? How do you find them safe, affordable housing, right? And so within the city, that is very, very difficult. And so BFNC is an organization that we own several properties, and a lot of them are older properties. And what actually happened is that my predecessor um, came in and we owned uh, we owned two, two settlement houses, and one of which we had to kind of board up because we couldn't really use it anymore. And it began, okay, what, what do we do with this building, right? It's like in the middle of a block, people live across the street. We want to be good neighbors, you know, and, you know, we, we really want to do that. And at the time, we also uh, received a grant from the state of New York to work with seniors, um, and it was the balancing initiatives program, right? So it was a pilot project to help seniors with care management and, and kind of stay in community. And what we found is that it was very difficult to do so. A lot of times our, our seniors in the city had to move, they had to move to the suburbs. And so the statistics showed that when you start displacing um, older individuals, right, the quality of life goes down, they get sicker, all of these things. And so we're like, hey, we have this big building. Like, what if we could build this aging in place kind of model? That's how we got into development. I came into the project because, and maybe we'll talk about it a little later, there's a lot of time and effort that has to go into developing a project. So our first project was Westminster, it's known as Westminster Commons. It was $23 million project. It's 84 affordable units um, in the city of Buffalo. So yeah, I was kind of thrown into it. Great. So before we move on to the questions, I want to give a little bit of structure to how we're going to do this panel today. I'm going to ask my friend Brittany over there to do make sure we have a time check because okay. we have two panels today. We have our Western New York panel and then we have our New York City panel. And so we have to leave enough time for it to do both, of course. And so I think around, let's see, 6 05, maybe you should make sure that we're wrapping up. Um, and so we have just a short series of questions that we're going to discuss. After we do that, we'll maybe take a question or two if we have time from this audience, but then we're going to switch over to our New York City panel. 
Does that sound okay for everybody? Yeah. You all understand what we're doing? <laughs> yes. Audience at home. Audience in your city. Speaking yeah. of the audience at home, we have 23 active participants uh, tuned in online as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Okay. <laughs> so my first question is for you to tell us a little bit about, you have told us a little bit about your career path, but I want you to pick a challenge you want to add. Tell us how you overcame that challenge in your career path. You want to start, Chandra, since you have the mic? <laughs> <laughs> so, Right. So there's lots of challenges that have come up and yeah, it's kind of hard to pick one, but one thing that has been consistent, unfortunately, is, is just the discouragement, right? One of the things is as women, I think, particularly in this arena, people kind of say, oh, you can't do that or mm, that's not for you. I know when we were working on Westminster Commons, um, there were some challenges in the fact that we were, you know, we're a mid-sized organization. People were like, I don't think you're going to pull the funding together. I don't think you're going to do this. And that's very discouraging when you're first time out, right? Like when you talk to people, you want them to be like, yeah, you can do this. And this is it. And people were like, oh, you know, well, you know, I, I applied like five times and they told me no. And like, you're hearing stuff like that. I've been on vacation like five years, right? So like, <laughs> and so that that really was very honestly discouraging, right? Having people say, oh, well, you know, you're not going to get funded or yeah, we kind of been talking because let's just face it, there is a club that exists mm -hmm. someplace, right? Like we'll talk about the club later. And, you know, <laughs> and, and yeah, we don't, we don't really think so, right? And you're like, wow, that just really, it's, it's very discouraging. It's very disheartening. But one of the things that I can say, and I know maybe we'll get to it later, is, is your team is important because this is really hard work and it requires a lot of support. So during the times when people were like, this is not going to happen, this is ridiculous, you know, you, you guys have never did a project before, you know, why, what makes you think you can do a project this big? How are you going to like support this project? You know, where are you getting all this money from? Um, they would say, you know what, but, but we've seen this done and we can do this. And I think having people that were really skilled at what they did say to me, no, there's there, there's an answer to this. And there's an answer to that helped to reassure me that, okay, this can get done and, and we can do this. So even though it was this big pie in the sky type of thing that we came up with as a team, at the end, I'm like, we're going to make it to the finish line, right? And I remember during the, um, the ribbon cutting telling the story of the little engine that could. And that's kind of how I felt the entire time. So it was like, I think I can, I think I can. And then... We were right up to like we're about to start to lease up. It was like I know I can. Okay, so discouragement, but being able to overcome that, yes. like the low end. Yes. Great. Okay. Um. So I would say it was very hard to narrow this down to just one one thing, and I, I'm gonna agree with you on the on the discouragement. Um. But if if I take it back to housing and affordable housing. Um, and the challenges I, I have with that, I would say that my biggest challenge is, okay, well, there's actually two. So one is getting at the table with the right people. Um, you know, and for a long time in where I where I have worked, I would, a lot of people were like, oh, you're too young to, you know, you're too young, you need to wait. And, you know, and, and now I'm like, well, I'm not young anymore, for one thing. <laughs> and for another, why can't I? Um, you know, that's how I look at it. Um, but the other issue that I really face as a nonprofit with, in affordable housing is just getting the funding or the seed money or the capital to build capacity. Um, I was telling Tyra that we have, we got a list of, we're, as we're starting our critical home repair program, um, we got a list of Niagara Falls residents. This is Niagara Falls only. Um, the list for critical home repairs is over 500 families in Niagara Falls. And we're, we're a small habitat affiliate. We're not a large one. But I can see us growing and, you know, providing a lot of help 
to those who want to stay in their homes and, and make their homes livable for longer. And it, it's just a matter of getting the right people, the team, um, and get us all moving on the bus together going forward and you know, trying to work to build and save affordable housing. So again, being told you can't do something, yeah. but saying, yes, I can. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I definitely faced those challenges. Mm -hmm. And then I was also thinking about when I was thinking about this question this morning of approaching this both personal challenges and professional challenges, and those are kind of intertwined. But I think for me, and the challenge I haven't figured out how to surpass is how to balance doing the work with also the care responsibilities um, of being a mom, being a daughter. And that's not solely a challenge for women, but it is more often a challenge for women than, than for men. Um, and the fact that two of the panel, myself and Gina, brought our children with us tonight, <laughs> I think. With welcome our right, <laughs> Shout out to all of you that when I said, like, well, only do this if because my partner also has an event tonight. And you were like, yeah, that's fine. So very, I appreciate the support. Um, so that's kind of the personal, I think on the professional, when I was thinking about challenging situations, it kept coming back to this kind of, what I was calling the, challenge, the, the collaboration challenge, that real estate is inherently a collaborative effort, that you can't do it yourself. You need architects and builders and lawyers and, code enforcement officials and investors. And there is a stereotype and a tendency in the real estate world to, for the owner to just be a bully, to just scream at everyone and to get it done. And that's not my style. That's not a space I'm comfortable in. And I also don't think that's always quite as effective for women as it is for men. Mm -hmm. So how do I still get everything done and in a, and so then it ends up coming down to this emotional labor of figuring out like, okay, this person I have to call, this person I have to email. And I emailed that person. When did I email them? Oh, I emailed them five days ago. Okay, so let me set up the email now and have it go out tomorrow because it's, only, it's appropriate to email them six days after I last <laughs> got in touch with them. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I feel that of like, you're not allowed to contact me for two weeks. Also, I'm just like a little extra and overthink everything, but you know that about me. Um, but I do think when we're doing these major real estate projects, and I was thinking of a closing I was doing, and I was like, okay, there's an equity investor, a construction lender, three state agencies, a city agency, um, two architects, a GC, and all of them need to come together to make this $20 million deal happen. And my role as owner or owner's rep is not to actually do anything. Like I don't design it, I don't build it, I don't pay for it, but I'm just in the center of the storm, making sure that it doesn't Every spiral time. out of control. <laughs> um, and how to do, how to, how to keep hurting the cats is always the, yeah. the biggest challenge I've, I've faced when I thought about the individual challenges. You brought up so many things. So you talked about <laughs> balance uh, between you being a caregiver, whether it's for your parents or your children. And uh, side note, many people know this here, but a lot of, of Jen and I have the same daycare, so I often run into her. And Maggie, who also works with her team, is at the daycare. And so is Brittany, who also works with her team. It's a lot of meetings. So, yes, <laughs> the parking lot of the JCC is where we have meetings <laughs> oftentimes. But that's what needs to happen to get it done, right? Um, and then you mentioned the fact that you are trying to navigate communication styles. Um, and that's something that I, I know a little bit about as well. But I'm thinking I'm relating back to my days when I was working in construction. And I realized that there's there's different communication styles. It may be generational. Yeah. It may be gender related. It may be there's all these other issues that come into play. I was telling somebody the other day, you need to email me. And they're like, well, everybody I work with wants a phone call. Oh, well, you know, I don't, I'm really bad at phone calls. So. <laughs> but you brought up a lot of important issues. Um, while you have the mic, 
I know we've talked about, all of you have talked about getting capital. And usually that's the thing that comes up the most, what's the most difficult issue uh, when you're working through these deals. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, and you brought up some significant things already. Are there any other things that you have come to that said, you know, this is like, this is a reoccurring issue and maybe some insight on how you get past that? Yeah, I mean, I think all that a super real issue, especially if you're a first time developer, that once you get started, you have, you know, revenue from your past developments, you have developer fee that you can invest in the next project. So that startup and pre-development capital mm -hmm. is really hard to find. Um, so that's a big challenge. I think other also finding sites. Finding sites. Yes, okay. and finding sites and securing them because you can find them, but then if it's in, a, I mean, I'm working with this group, um, Family Promise of Western New York. They want to build a new emergency shelter in um, sort of adjacent to downtown near their current location. And so finding a site that works, then figuring out, well, will the seller do a long-term option agreement or can we find the money to buy it now? So that's one of them. Um, yeah, I think site acquisition is probably, it, it's related to capital, but that would, I would add that to the list. How about you, Gina? Right, well, you know, I we go to a lot of organizations, um, community organizations and foundations, you know, different people to sponsor the actual build, including, you know, um, New York State and, and that sort of thing. But when you said site acquisition, that is a major issue. Um, I can't tell you how many times I'm thinking of a grant application I, I wrote and I had to go back in and change the address three different times because you get to a certain point and then something falls through. Um, you know, and, and so I think that is a huge factor. Um, I know in, in my world, I have plenty of families that need affordable housing. I have plenty of families who need affordable repair options. I don't have the, the site acquisition always. And I, and, you know, if I had more staff, I could do more in the community and I have plenty of volunteers, contractors, all of it to to do the other parts. Mm -hmm. But yes, the definitely the site acquisition is and ramping up the yeah to ramping up. Yeah. So I would agree with site acquisition. Um, also I think when you start looking at um, community input and community buy-in, yes. because you can find a site but it doesn't mean as a person who wants to buy the site that the people in the community want you to buy that site community. and to build on that site. Yep. Yep. And that is very challenging. And what we found is it's a big challenge because, you know, you have people that come in and develop and they don't talk to community. Um, they may make promises that they don't follow through on. And so community members, you know, they're kind of tired. And there's been a lot of development in this area. And so people are like, really, they're like, no more big buildings. Right. right, no more big buildings, but then you get into the capital issue, right? Because as a developer, you know, when you start doing smaller buildings, it it's just, it doesn't work out, yeah. right? So it's how do you balance the fact that, you know, because we're very, we are a community-based organization, first and foremost. So it's like, well, the community doesn't want this, but we know this would be good and this is needed, but there's a lot of opposition. Yeah. And so that's a big challenge and it's a lot of work to try to help people understand, you know, so why tell we us want a little to. bit about that. How do you get people to understand? What, do you have a secret thoughts? Do you knock on doors? Do you talk to your humble person first? What is, what is, we're figure that out, aren't we? Okay. Um, because really, because I mean, there's always conversations. So how I learned was that you kind of have all these conversations simultaneously. No one likes to feel like you came to them last, right? right? So it's almost like, you have to have your project together. You got to have your team together. And then it's like, all right, let's pull the trigger and we're going to put it out there and we're going to start all these meetings. And it's a lot of work. And then, you know, they're like, well, did you talk to this person? You talk to that person. And then really, I mean, I think we knocked on doors. We like, I literally re recall walking the streets and putting flyers in people's doors. And they're like, what's this? I'm like, oh, well, we're doing this rehab. We're building this building and we're having a meeting. So we want you to come. And we had pretty good turnout for a lot of our meetings, we did, but I think it was all the effort that we put into making sure 
We wanted people to know this is what we're doing. And we got opposition from people, but we answered their questions. And at the end of the day, it was, you know what? We can't promise that we can do that. And I tell it to everyone, like, just be honest with people. If you can't do it, just say you can't do it. Don't say, oh yeah, we're gonna like give you, you know, a health club, you know, in the middle of our, you know, half an acre. It's, it's not happening. Um, so just being honest, but a lot of door to door and you have to talk to people. And I know that COVID kind of changed that a lot. There was a lot of virtual, but particularly when you're doing development, um, I'll say like in, in East Buffalo, no, people need to come out and see each other. So you're not capturing everybody virtually. You can't say that's community outreach, but transparency, knocking on doors, um, you know, we advertise, hey, we're having this meeting, like, come, you know, we want to hear what you have to say. We want to show you because we need advocates in community that says like, yeah, this is what's going to go on there. Or when the construction trucks are there and it's super noisy, what's going on there? Oh, yeah, well, they're building this and this is what it's going to be. I heard be honest, be transparent, and tell everybody at the same time. That you're <laughs> okay, I want to just go back to the, the site acquisition. Is there any secret that you can tell us in terms of how you, I know that's a big question, but maybe there's a lesson learned that you can share in terms of what not to do when you're trying to acquire a site or what not to do when you're applying for something and you think you have a site. <laughs> I'll tell you what to do. Okay. Which I'm learning. Yeah. So, <laughs> This is why networking is really important. And I know that development is, uh, it's very competitive. And so everyone's like, I don't want to tell you what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to say, it's not that idea. But yeah. I know in particular, when you start talking about city sites, they want you to talk. They, they don't want 10 people coming and saying, we want this block over here. Or they're like, well, did you talk to this person? Because they came here last week. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is we have to figure out as developers how to have these conversations with each other, right? Like this is what I'm looking to do. Um, I was at a meeting, I think a couple months ago or so, where they had like a map and they were like, okay, where's your project? And so we were able to see, oh, your project's like three blocks from mine. Yours is like a block from mine. Yours is across the street. And we didn't know that, right? And there was a group of us nonprofit developers that were like, all right, let's just, let's just take a chance. And let's just be transparent and let people know what we're trying to do and what we're thinking about doing. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately you put all this work and money into something and to go and say, I want this land. And they're like, oh no, well, agency XYZ came and you know they have this thing. Did you know that? It's a waste of time. So we have to start talking to each other about what we're thinking about doing. Everybody start talking to each other. Any other secrets when it comes to, or not so mm -hmm. secret advice? I think, I think one that I've had is just not to get yourself so caught up on a particular site, mm -hmm. but rather what the project you want to do is and can it translate to somewhere else? Um, because a lot of the sites fall through, as, as we talked about. You come to project usually with backup for I'm learning that, yes. Mm -hmm. that That is. That is really, that's been very key for us. And I would say for, for my affiliate of Habitat, you know, most people know what Habitat for Humanity does, but I am quite surprised often at the, the folks in, that don't know what we do. They think that we're, Habitat is for animals because it's Habitat, mm -hmm. or they think that we give away homes. We don't give away homes. It is, a, you know, an affordable mortgage that the family can afford. Um, we're not a foundation. I, you know, I get that a lot as well. So I think, you know, trying to just get what we do out there to all of the neighborhoods that we are working with, I think that's really key. And I, th I think we're making progress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got some great partners that came to us this year um, to want to help us, uh, you know, acquire land or, or they're coming to the table with us to have meetings with different agencies. And it's really exciting to see all that happen. Great, great. Jen, I'm going to ask you to maybe switch gears a little bit because you started this conversation telling us about, and you're one of these people that are part of a team. So you talked yeah. about the attorneys and all the different sources of funding. So tell us about how you get that right team together. Um, can I think two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the acquisition one, just being a detective of, oh, it's 605. Okay, just be a detective. 
Um, she was telling me that too. <laughs> um, so, if you're in Buffalo, like the city has a database, there used to be ORS, now it's the Buffalo Re Property Report Card that will tell you who owns it, what their address is, send them letters. At one site, I didn't get it, but I figured out that the person who owned it, his brother owned a corner store across the street, and I just started going there every couple of weeks. <laughs> and right. Plain detective, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so in terms of team, I really like to find teams of people who have experience in the thing that I'm trying to do. So especially in the affordable housing world um, and the particularly like low-income housing tax credit, um, stuff it is pretty complicated pretty regulated so um for example sakina i i only want to work with her law firm because i just want to say plug for sakina she is an attorney yes <laughs> um, <laughs> the firm of and Heyman Weiss. and um i want to work with them because they know the attorneys at the state they know the attorneys at the city they know the process they have an entire database of they can just be like, oh, this was a similar to a deal over here. Let us look up how we did that document. Architects, I kind of want an architect who has worked with the state on these kinds of projects before. Just because they, I, while I'm building my expertise and my experience, I don't always feel like the biggest expert in the room. So I kind of want my team to have that experience too. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I don't, there are times where it makes sense to work with someone new, but just recognizing that you're going to have to then work with their learning curve. So I think when I'm assembling a team, especially now that I'm going into places that I don't, you know, I'm not working in a place that I've worked in for 10 years, just trying to like figure out, okay, if I'm working with this funding source, who else is working with it? And so I, ha I can rely on a strong team. Great. Gina, you already started talking about ramping up your team. Do you have any other quick comments about building your team in these projects? Though, um, I feel like you can learn from everyone's experience, and that's really important to me to make sure every that I hear. I mean, that I'm not. You, there's a difference between being bogged down by a lot of opinions, but then also being mindful of people's experience and knowing that um you know this person comes from a different background than me and i never thought of it that way you know i mean I, I fully believe in that you know um that's a big thing for me is and i feel very very fortunate i have a very small team but the folks i do have are amazing and i'm so thankful for that and same with my board i feel that way you know i i feel like i've really lucked out <laughs> Um, so I agree. I, I will say that as um, a minority developer, uh, one of the things that I recognize is that you really have to like people that you're working with. Um, and that sometimes the people that are highly recommended, although they have great expertise, they're not used to necessarily working with minorities. And so there were conversations that I had to have with some people because there were just values that I had in doing my project. And it is what it is. And the other thing I'll say is these are long-term relationships. <laughs> yes. So they're not done just after the project's done, right? You really Don't burn those to, right? you really need to get along. You're gonna fight, you're gonna argue, but you need to get along with these people. So just keep that in mind. Okay, great. So I'm not sure if we have time for any questions right now. So I'm going to look into the camera and ask my team member, Stephanie, um, if it's time for us to take the break and switch to the other panel, or if we can ask one or two questions here in house that might be work. You got unmute. It's time. It's time to wrap so we can transition. <laughs> All right. Well, the timing right on my part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So just as a reminder, we're going to take a little bit of a break so we can change the kind of who we're looking at, so give us a few minutes, but then we'll start talking, okay? Uh, we're going to take just a five-minute intermission so we can transition the uh, panels.
and then just finding the capital. So very excited to hear uh, from you all. Thank you, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Okay. Welcome back to part two of Rising Together, Women Leading in Real Estate and Development. Uh, I'm Christine Rensoff O'Connell. I'm the Director of Community Development Investments here at List New York. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. They are entrepreneurs, founders, and also um, all three are graduates of our List New York Developers of Color training program. Um, we have, first we have Dawn Davis, who is the co-founder of Williams and Davis Consultants Corporation. Then we have Erica Keller, She's our chairperson and CEO of Brisbane Builders Corporation. And then we have Alexis McSween, who's the founder and CEO of Bottom Line Construction and Development. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Can you hear me in Western New York? <laughs> they might have vacated. Yeah, That's all right. If you can hear me, then I'm going to keep going. If, if not, please let me know in the chat. Okay. So I'm going to launch, actually. Please give me a two minute overview of your experience. I'd like to start with a two minute overview of your experience. Is experience with the company? Yes. Okay. I have a soft voice, so I think I should. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. Is it on? Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, try pressing the button. Yeah. It should be green. Can you hear me? Okay, now. <laughs> Okay, my name is Dawn Davis. I'm with WD Consultants Corporation. Um, I would say it's a merger between myself and Brownstone NYC. Um, we primarily deal with, it's a lot to deal with, to be honest with you, um, lobbying, advocating. Um, we have liaisons in the state and um, local um, governmental agencies. We have over 31 nonprofits. Um, that we lobby for. We have over 31 um, locations that we have site control over. Um, we also do um, community partnerships. Uh, my partner really believes in that, doing community partnerships. Um, those partnerships tend to be in the, I guess, the Brooklyn, Queens, and Bronx area. Um, we also, um, in the lobbying, we also lobby for w, um, WMBEs and making sure that they're treated fairly and make, making sure that they're paid on time. Um, and we also have to lobby for uh, different uh, educational facilities, um, making sure that they are also paid on time and, and not having um, to fight for their money. So that's our main focus, I would say. Good evening, everyone. My name is Good Evening. My name is Erica Keller, and I am the chairperson CEO of Brisa Builders Corp., which is a second-generation family-owned general contracting firm based in Brooklyn. Um, we've been in existence since 1997, and our primary focus um, at the commencement of the organization was building HUD 202s which were federally funded senior housing, usually 100 units or less throughout the five boroughs in New York City. And most of them were sponsored by faith-based organizations. I joined the company in 2012. And in 2016, I founded my own company entitled Brisa Builders Development LLC. And our focus is primarily or has been on working with faith-based organizations for the city programs, the ELLA, the SARA to develop affordable housing and mixed use buildings, new construction. We've recently expanded into um, Section 8 renovation rehabs, as well as a New England market. So we work in communities where we realize that affordability is challenged. It's very difficult to live in New York City. Um, and so we work to ensure that there is affordability as neighbor neighborhoods begin to gentrify. And we have started a New England market, again, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, places where it is diff it's difficult to find affordable housing. Good evening. Uh, <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Alexis McSween. 
I am the founder and CEO of Bottom Line Construction and Development, as well as the founder of our uh, nonprofit arm, Youth Construct. Uh, bottom line, we've been in business for about 12 years and three months. Um, we basically focus on the New York City area, all five boroughs. We perform government contracts on schools, MTA. We work with EDC. Um, we uh, currently are on about several projects throughout the five boroughs, um, all public works projects, with the exception of one uh, primary project, the Victoria Theater, which is a private project. Um, we are extremely impact driven, mission driven, even though we are for profit on the for profit side. And we carried that over to the nonprofit arm for about going on its second year. We have our second cohort. Um, my passion is definitely affordable housing development. That's kind of where I've come from. Um, having been housing challenged as a youth and having, work, having worked as a nurse and an EMT for the fire department in New York City, you know, you're in and out of all types of people's homes and you see all sorts of disparities. And a lot of my passion came from that and I've just been carrying it along. Uh, currently, we are in the, um, I guess, the waiting pattern for a few RFPs that are strictly affordable housing, some supportive affordable, and uh, looking to get more into that space. Previous projects were pretty much private developments, um, and it was pretty challenging trying to put that piece together of our impact side uh, with the other lack of resources and so on, but we'll talk about that more. So that's pretty much who we are. Thank you. Well, thank you for the overview. You guys have amazing stories. I'm so glad that you're on this panel tonight. Um, so our previous panel in Buffalo, they talked about access to capital acquisition and support, building networks as needs and also sometimes barriers um, to advancement in our industry. So can you share one barrier that you experience or experienced um, and how you overcome or overcame those barriers? Because we have a strong focus in lobbying, um, we're able to definitely get a lot of opportunities because of our liaison relationships. We don't seem to have a problem with the vetting of locations um, neither as well. Um, but our problem has been circumvention from um, sometimes some agencies. Um, through our liaisons, um, we have been able to put their feet to fire, so to speak, and we're working on that and some of those opportunities we're um, able to reestablish and we're gonna do well in that, but that's only because of, as I said, the lobbying and the liaison, but that's the major part, the circumvention and circumvention at levels that should not exist. So I would say that my experience in this field has been fraught with barriers, right? I feel like um, I am somewhat of a unicorn um, <laughs> because uh, the, the New York Times recently released an article and they said that there are approximately a little over 111,000 white owned real estate development firms. And in comparison, there are 447 black owned real estate development firms and 175 Latino owned real estate development firms. And I would be quite curious to see if they disaggregated that data in terms of male and female, right? That the numbers would probably get closer to single digits. Um, and because even in the article itself, the nine developers that they sort of highlighted and talked about, they were all men. And so this field has, which is a second career, much like Alexis, we connected because I came into this as a second career. I was an educator for 25 years. I was a principal and did a hard shift 
when my stepmother passed away and I realized that we did not have a succession plan for the family business and that they had worked so hard at what they did and that there was really no way to carry that forward. So I left my career and joined the family business and had to learn feet to ground. And because of that, that was an additional disadvantage because this is a very capital intensive business. And for most people of color and also, you know, and as a woman, it's just um, expectations or what people think about who the developer is it usually isn't a woman. And then also being a black woman, there were additional challenges and barriers from a capacity standpoint, from a capitalization standpoint. So it's been a struggle. And I think, you know, since um, the pandemic and what has happened with how po police brutality has been brought to the forefront, and the just disparity that has existed in this country for so many years, there's a lot of conversation. We have an article in the New York Times about it, but there has to be a lot of action to bring about equity in order for it to be um, a place where we talk about no barriers. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done. We are consistently challenged, even as we have moved from being a small real estate development firm to a midsize, medium-sized development firm in terms of, you know, the measures that people use for that, we're still challenged mm -hmm. in reference to, you know, getting capital, getting the support that we need in order to get out of a cycle of, you know, <coughs> pay, paying, pay, robbing, what is this saying, robbing Paul and pay Peter, mm -hmm. right? And also I do see some, you know, efforts on the agency's part and with the lenders, but there's still so much more that has to be done. And when I first started in this field, it was just, it was really, um, you know, it was such an eye-opening experience. In some instances, I felt like I had gone back 30 years in time. And even though I wasn't around in the 1950s, I've seen historically, and I felt like that. Like I've been in situations where I was sitting outside and they were saying that they were waiting for the developer right? and didn't acknowledge that I was the developer. <laughs> so it's it's been it's been a challenge. It really has been. She said it wrong. <laughs> um, so, like Erica, there's so many, and you want us to pick one, right? Okay. Um, I would say. I was gonna say. For me, I was gonna say bonding, right? And that, but that's too simple um, because bonding is pretty much, if you're bondable, then that means you've overcome a lot of those challenges <clears throat> because bonding is all about the access to the capital, right? And the family wealth and your assets. So imagine our first big project in New York City, we couldn't get the bonding that we needed so that we could be a part of our own project, right? So I'm just saying that to say that <coughs> the financial capacity, bonding relies on your financial capacity, your assets, your, your spouse, all those things fall into play and all of those things are up for grabs. And so we are literally as female, you know, women of color in development and construction, we're sort of leading the charge. And we have to be intentional and purposeful about our projects. We can't go into our communities and build these projects out of the ground and don't have any of us involved in them, whether it be brick and mortar or professionally. So for me, that's a big deal. Um, trying to have a voice in the room when I'm sitting down at a closing or I'm negotiating um, a purchase, an acquisition, you know, and having lenders try to dictate who's going to work on the project, uh, who's capable of working on the project and having and being able to say, no, I need this. I need these people as part of my project. I need people from the com community to be on my project because it's super important. It was super important to me to see other people doing something so impactful as developing a project out of the ground. Right now, I mean, during the pandemic, our 
contracts went down to one and we had one project. And the only reason we had that one project was because it was deemed um, essential. So we had affordable units going on. And so everyone was struggling. Our communities were struggling. So you figure if we have family members and friends that are not in the uh, sort of affordable housing space, then everybody was home without work. And we were the ones that went to work every day during the pandemic and tried to sort of supplement, as women do, <laughs> tried to supplement our family, okay? And that's when we said, you know what? All of the New York summer internship programs had stopped. And then we were working on this great project. And I said, let's start bringing the kids in and teaching them about, you know, their environment instead of all of the, as Erica said, all of the bad things that were going on in the news, all of the injustices that were going on in the news. And so these kids see projects going up in their neighborhood and they don't have any clue what goes into the project other than, oh, there's construction workers over there. But you guys know that there's so much more work that goes into just the brick and mortar piece. And so the, the challenges are, are endless. There are solutions. And I would say for me, it's just, I'm never going to give up. So I'm always going to come back to the table. I'm always going to advocate for us. I'm going to advocate for the people in the community. And I'm going to get them into our spaces and get them in front of the people they need to be in front of so that we can all get ahead. So I'm very collaborative. And so the question was, how do I, what are the obstacles? We kind of all know the obstacles. And so the, my, my tactic, which I'm an individual, everybody's different, is to make sure everybody has a seat at the table and be committed about it and be purposeful and intentional about it. And let you know that it's important to me. And so that's pretty much, that kind of gives you the strength to walk, to walk in the room bold. Um, it gives you the strength to speak up. And so that's kind of, you know, how, and aligning yourself with other people that operate the same way, that have a bigger mission, a, a, bit, a, a broader reach. Um, and so that goes to organizations like LISC, organizations like Enterprise, you know, organizations surrounding yourself around people and organizations that have that same mission, NIREC, things like that. Um, that's what I would say for me, that's a couple of ways that I tackle those. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing all of your experiences. And Alexis, I think we're gonna go right into the next question that, that deals exactly with what you just discussed, but that's great. Um, so as women, when we advance in our careers, we often reach back and pull those behind us up. It's just, we have a macro perspective. Um, so considering your experiences, how are you working to remove or lessen barriers uh, or inequities for other female developers of color? Well, I would say um, mentorship. I started a outside of lobbying, outside of what my partner and I do. Um, I started a um, nonprofit 501c3 to um, incentivize and to help th those um, women, um, much younger women that, you know, I'm in my um, late 40s so that when they're at this age, they don't need to wait for that and that they can be, number one, well-prepared, well-read, well-studied. So when they're in that room, you know, they're prepared to, because sometimes you only get that one opportunity. Um, so that's what my primary focus on is on and to, pay it forward. Um, and um, also, um, we, we also find uh, challenges, uh, not just in the, I guess, when I say minority, not just African American, but also Latino, then also um, those that came immigration, um, that are immigrants that maybe are first or second generation and um, don't that don't have that those opportunities that I did have. So I wanna pay it forward for that too. And, and that's what I'm doing. It's, you know, instead of talking about it, you have to be about doing the action. And that's what we're doing. Um, even my partner does um, mentorships as well. Thank you. So we've been very uh, strategic and intentional about um, bringing people to the table, because as Alexis says, that's really how you 
propel a movement is when you have more people around you that have the same vision, the same mission, um, that's how you move forward, right? It's like a wave. And so we have been very strategic on all levels. So from the development standpoint, you know, there, there was an MWBE um, RFP that was released um, several years ago. And then there was a second one in both instances, the requirement was that you had to be minority or women business certified or a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And, but you also had to have developed 50 units or more, mm -hmm. which is, you know, <laughs> it, it was kind of an oxymoron of what they were trying to accomplish in terms of making access. So in both instances, I was intentional in partnering or bringing as part of the team a minority women business enterprise that did not meet that threshold mm -hmm. so that they would then have an opportunity if we were successful in the RFP to now have that experience for whatever next step would be for them, right? Because it always takes that one opportunity mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to have the experience to apply for more. Mm -hmm. So we were very strategic about that back in 2000 and, and 15 when the first one came out, as well as the second one that was, I think, a couple of years ago now. Um, and then from the development perspective, we're very strategic in working with the GC, if we are the GC ourselves or construction manager, or if not, if we have a third party, we are very intentional about, about meeting and exceeding those benchmarks um, that have been set by HPD or um, you know, the state, which is a little bit more well-known, the 30% thresholds. But HPD in 2017 put forth a, a, a program called the MWB Builder Program. So 25% of city subsidies must be spent on um, minority or women-owned businesses. And that's throughout the development process. So it could be professional services or hard costs. And so in the projects that we have participated in, we have exceeded those thresholds by almost double. Mm -hmm. So if the requirement was $6 million of contracts, we've made 12 million, right? And so that shows that the whole adage of, oh, we can't find competent, capable companies is not true, right? If you need one, come see me. Right? So um, we are very strategic about that. We, you know, we in, we look at all of the professional services and we make a point to support um, minority businesses, women-owned businesses. We are really, really serious about that, and we keep the data to show that this is possible if you put the thought behind it. And it's about relationship building, right? So we have. Organizations, again, like NIRAC and CURE and other organizations that really support that work as well, because you could just have a conversation with the person next to you and you can likely find um, a company that can serve in any one of the capacities throughout the development process. <laughs> I think I answered this before. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say, I mean, I did say I was intentional I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, but I think for that project we did in Harlem, um, it was an HPD site as well. And I put in a proposal, it took a while, and I actually won that site. But my goal was to do affordable housing, strictly affordable housing. And to my dismay, um, due to financial constraints and some zoning constraints, that wasn't possible. And so like, as, as we do, it was a pivot to make sure that that project looked like something I wanted to be a part of. And so it was important to me to make sure I had people from the community building that project. And, and it was a lot of meetings and insistence um, literally, you know, speaking up that person and their resume and what they've done. And for the entire team, I had to account for everyone. I had to account for the mechanical engineer, the structural engineer, every single person that worked in that project. I had to like beef up, you know, even though they had experience, but it was just, I wasn't in a position with the capital to make all of those decisions. So 
I think I was pretty successful. We, you know, there were no limitations on that project. It didn't wind up being affordable, but it definitely exceeded MWBE goals, if you want to say. Um, so I would say that is, in addition to starting the nonprofit, that is a way just to always make sure um, the people in the community are at the table and not just looking through a slit window into a construction site. Um, and also networking, you know, because of the uh, LISC Developer of Color program, we, we were in the in, inaugural cohort. Um, I was able to reach out to Erica. I mean, we talk about mentorship and having people in your circle that you can communicate to and say like, is this really worth it? Because believe it or not, as an MWBE contractor developer, people reach out to us all the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's necessarily a path you should follow. And so it's really important for us to be in this space. And it was super important that I could call Erica and say, what, it, what about this CDFI? Or what about these people? Should I join this program? Should I do this? And that's how I was able to become a member of NIRAC and get involved with LISC and enterprise and, and just really uplift all of the organizations that are doing the good work. And so that's pretty much, I would say, how we give back. Amazing. So these are very tangible investments that you guys are making into your network, into the next generation. Um, it's, it's really empowering to hear. So thank you for that. Um, so the next question as a follow-up, and we do we have five minutes left, um, but we wanted to ask what resources would you recommend for women who are looking to grow in their careers? I know we mentioned NIREX, there's some networking opportunities within the industry, but um, what else would you recommend? Well, obviously it's, it's LISP, um, it's, it's LISP, but what I, cause I come from a different era, area than the young ladies do. Um, I study, um, a lot of the, um, the the city charter got um, the state charter got to know the different um, agencies, and then from those agencies, just with networking, um, and I hate to say internships, but somewhat like that, um, mm -hmm. and opportunities such as this. That's that's how I did it. Um, but also, I'm new to New York. I've only been here for three years, so so I. I'm not that uh, season far as, you know, 10, 15 years, but that's how I did it. Um, I would say the same thing, like professional organizations, you know, um, LISC, um, the community-based organizations like LISC and Enterprise and LIF um, that have, you know, in CSH, Corporation for Supportive Housing, that provide those supports to organizations in their infancy stages, as well as different financing options and grants. Um, staying abreast of those types of programs, really connecting yourself with those organizations. Also the professional organizations like we spoke of NIRAC and CURE and um, NISAFA. Um, I think that's an important tool that can be utilized um, by folks who are either new to the industry or making a transition, or even if not so new to the industry, I think those types of connections are important and, and they're also informational um, provision as well. And I, and I would also say as of recent, the agencies have been very um, focused on disparity and, and, and thinking about, you know, ways to um, make the playing field more equitable. And so they have programs that I think are important to avail yourself to and just checking their website every once in a while and per perusing through and seeing what they have available is really another way upon which to um, seek resources. Um, I would say definitely HPD has a really robust website and if you're strictly speaking on affordable housing, you know, it's a great website to follow and sort of dig into because it talks about all the acronyms that you need to kind of get familiar with. You can get familiar with the various term sheets that, you're, that are needed for affordable housing. Um, they have resources and outreach. Uh, we already mentioned uh, LISC, definitely. 
LISC is doing some great work right now on affordable housing, um, trying to create 5,000 affordable units in New York City. Um, they also have um, their developer of color program, which is excellent and it just keeps getting better and better and better. Um, I would definitely reach out for the next class on that. Um, CDFIs, I don't know if we mentioned your CDFIs, but CDFIs are a great resource. Um, they can be a little bit more flexible when you come into projects that you want to do, whether it be affordable or not affordable. So I would definitely look into your CDFIs and just really put yourself out there and follow your passion. And um, that's about it. I love this. This is great. So we talked about um, keeping your network alive. Tyra mentioned that your network is a living, breathing thing. So you have to nurture it. You have to, you have to take care of it. Um, but keeping yourself informed and understanding what's coming down the pike and just um, what's available. And as a plug for CDFIs, you know, LISC is a CDFI. And, and um, one of the things that we often do is talk to new developers who may not be completely aware or, or understand maybe an HPD term sheet or how to underwrite a project, how to make the budget numbers work. And that's something that we can do. We can support um, support you and sort of talk it out and figure out if there's a solution. That's, that's what we're here for. So please do reach out. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our panel. So I'd like to say thank you, a very warm thank you to our panelists. Stephanie in the room. Stephanie, we just concluded. Um, I'm going to hand it over. Oh, oh good. All right. So, um, okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie, Director of Partnerships and Programs. So, at this point of the program, we just wanted to open up for QA to both panels. We recognize that there is a question in the room for the Western New York panel. So we wanted to give an opportunity for that question to be uplifted. And any questions that anyone had, um, either way, we wanted to open this time up to invite those. So I know Shalentia, you had a question for our Western New York panel. I'm, bring, I'm bringing the mic. We're doing this old Oprah style. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shalentia Miles-Smith and I'm so, so grateful to be here. Um, I wanted to sort of just ask you guys, do you ever feel like you have to compete with each other? Because sometimes as a woman entrepreneur, I, they say women can be catty. And I just wanted to know, do you ever have that experience or do you, or is it really a sisterhood and you're just, you're fighting against the, the enemy? I just wanted to say. I just want to make sure that you can hear us. Yep, okay. We can hear you. Okay. So just to repeat the question is, do you ever feel like you have to compete against one another in this industry? I don't know if anyone wants to take that first. I mean, I, I mean, like you talk, you talked a little bit about competition and trying to break down that barrier and actually be more collaborative. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I don't. Yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Okay, so I'll say this. I think this here today is great. And I think there should be more of this mm -hmm. yeah. because we don't have this. Um, particularly when we're speaking um, of minority developers, minority women developers as well. I think in general, there's competition amongst developers and nonprofits have developed. And we do have to work on that. I think um, women developers, we are like unicorns. And so when you see someone, you're like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, right? <laughs> and you want to go to that person and you're like, let's talk about this. And what do you think about that? And, and so I, I think there is a feeling of relief when you find someone. Um, I, I'm probably guessing there's some apprehension depending upon the affiliation, because a lot of us are affiliated with other organizations. And I think that's where the competition comes in from an organizational standpoint. But I mean, I think the women in this room and in New York, um, it's a great starting point to say like, no, let's have these conversations and let's make room at the table for others. I'll, I'll say that in my um, career in nonprofit development, uh, 
development of construction. Um, it, it was very, very competitive, but I have found that within the Habitat for Humanity Network, we no project is alike, and we've all been through just like you know someone has been through something almost just like you, whether it's in New York State or across the country, and you know the willingness for for our executive leadership to share it has just been so phenomenal. Um, so I think I would love to see more of these types of things and to have that willingness to not be so guarded and protected. Yeah, I mean, I think I've certainly benefited from many other women and others who have given me mentorship, who have, you know, network willing to talk things out. I, as women in New York City were speaking, I was definitely jealous of all of the professional networks that are in New York City and that I remember when I worked there. and. That is certainly a challenge that I've found in Western New York that there just aren't as many of us doing this work. So it's harder to have professional networks. And my colleague Monica, she has one New York women in real estate, and it's literally stretching from Buffalo to Albany. And a it, long distance. It's so a long distance. That's a four and a half hour drive. <laughs> and so like she does events. It's like the next one is in Seneca Falls. And I'm like, I really want to go. Oh, that's a two and a half hour drive. I, um, we did, we organized something last year in last summer in Buffalo. And maybe we'll, and hopefully we'll do another Buffalo one. And now, uh, and I will make, um, hopefully I'll, I'm sure there's an email list so we can, um, get all of you on it. But yeah, I think those spaces for us to do this networking, um, are critical so that we're not being super catty and more collaborative. And I just wanted to take a moment and could we also uh, pose the same question to the panel in New York City? So if you wouldn't pick up, mind picking up the mic, I know maybe you touched upon this in the discussion, but give you an opportunity to share your insight. As far as the lobbying portion, no, because it's not, most of the lobbyists I end up talking to are normally white males. So I, I was, and I, don't, I know there are some women, but I don't feel that. However, with the development portion with women, yes, I always have, especially um, being a transplant and having opportunities that maybe some who, you know, were born and raised here haven't um, been fortunate enough to have. I do feel a lot of cattiness and um, putting obstacles in our way or my way for no reason. So when I first came into this um, industry about uh, 10 years ago now, um, everyone would say to me, oh, do you know Dewana? And I was like, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, but I was the better for when I did meet Dewana. Right, because she had been in this field, she had been doing it for, for a long time and had navigated the ways of New York City um, in development as a black woman. And so I think it is important to meet the person, right? And who has trailblazed before you so that you can learn, right? So we are now in the same circles in reference to organizations and advocacy and support. And I think that is so important particularly being a unicorn, right? That we are supporting one another um, to, to get the job done and to, to continuously battle against the barriers that exist. Thank you. Um, I would say once you, uh, you get into this space and you meet other women of color, there's not a lot of us to, um, sort of be your mentors, advisors, you know, I can't really say that I've felt a tremendous amount of cattiness or, or maybe I'm just so focused, I don't see it. Um, I haven't received that. I, what I do try to do is I realize, you know, especially if someone is sort of mentoring me, um, that I'm able to give something back as well. And so that's kind of how I approach 
people. So even when developer, female developers might call me and say, oh, you know, there's this site. It's, it's only, you know, 5,000 square feet. It's too small for me. I'm like, okay, <laughs> tell me more about it. <laughs> so, um, but also just not always, I don't go in always thinking I'm to be on the receiving end. And so I think when it comes to us, we've been through so much that we are used to running into people, all types of people that are only used to receiving. And so I just think that I don't come off that way. And that's pretty much work for me. So I haven't really seen all the cattiness yet. Um, so before we have one more question in the space, but Tyra, do you have any questions on your end? Open up to the floor. Does anybody have any questions? I think we might have time for one or two. I'm surprised because I know that some of the people in here are pretty talkative. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one. Just make sure that. Oh. Make sure you introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Brianna Tab. I am a nurse at um, Oshai Children's Hospital. And this question is for all the women on the panel. Um, just because I've been in the medical field for so long and everything is just kind of like just new to me. So I am in my mental space. I'm just like, where do I start? So like, if you can give some insight to where you started at and you know, how, how did you get over that hump of, can you do this? Like, you know. Sure, so we'll, um, Tyra, you can start here, Stephanie. Okay. And um, does anybody want to answer where to start? That's a big question. <laughs> so there, and there's so many things to learn, right? Um, and I think it also depends on what type of project you think you're going to go after, um, where you start. But in general, do you have any words of advice? So maybe a resource you can start with, people you can start with, organizations, uh, a book. <laughs> All of the above or none of the above? Thoughts? I don't know if I necessarily have the answer to that. I guess I can just say how I started, which was <laughs> I was interested in getting into specifically the nonprofit community development field. Um, so I think I learned about that in school. And so I was lucky enough at that moment to be in my 20s and being, and it was several years ago, so I could support myself with a part time coffee shop job and um, volunteering at a nonprofit that I was interested in. And that just kind of taught me a lot about the industry. And from there, just kind of showing up a lot till they then finally hired me. <laughs> um, so I think that's how the combination of education just and even if you know you're a nurse you are super busy so volunteering is probably a challenge but just getting going to all different community meetings or just like kind of networking and meeting people until you finally find something where you're like okay involve me in this so i i was in grant writing and um development for many many and I think that really did help me because especially when you start doing like different sponsored projects and things like that at, the, at a university level or um, being in, in that kind of field, you start seeing what the different, um, the different organizations or corporations that are part or agencies that are part of the government and how they want things. And I, once I sort of understood a, an application to a community foundation is very different than an application to say, well, HUD, um, you know, realizing that they all want a very good narrative, but there are so many, um, just making the details, that is involved, you know, try to find, try to figure out all the details, do your homework on that sort of thing. 
um, if, if you're going to be working with like the state government or the federal government, is what I would say. I would say get a good mentor or link up with someone that's a consultant mm -hmm. yep. because that's how I was able to learn and still learn, right? <laughs> um, I got thrown into it. I was a chief operating officer at an organization. They're like, yep, yeah, we got this project and it's very time consuming and it's your project. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. But we had some great consultants. We actually had two consultants that I worked with because there's the development piece with all the applications and the regulations, and then there's your government piece. And sometimes you get someone that's good at both. Um, it wasn't that one consultant wasn't, but we had another consultant that was really good and really connected in that area. But I had to learn. That's how I learned who do you call first? You don't know, use all the way at the same time. Right. Things like that. Like they would walk me through, like, no, 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 you got to do it this way. So if you can, um, and what I found is most of these people are really, especially women, they want to mentor. So it's not like they're going to charge you, right? They're going to be like, okay, like, can I take you out for coffee? Can we just talk about this? Or I ran across this. What does this mean? Like, I'm like, what are all these acronyms mean? I don't get this. This is not my world. But they were just really good at pouring into me. And so I was able then to start putting pieces together. And so one of my strengths is program design. So I could do that in my sleep. So figure out what piece you might be good at and then fill in the blanks by talking to other people, right? And it starts off like, I got this crazy idea that I think I want to do this. And they'll say, yeah, that's really crazy. And no, you don't want to do that. Or they'll say, I can't do it. So I think we have some responses from our panel um, here. So why don't we take those responses? And then I think that actually wraps up our, our evening. So I'm going to come back in with some closing remarks. But Alexis, I think that uh, kind of lit something up for you when the um, participant said that they were from the, the from nursing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so my background is cardiothoracic nursing. And, and I say, thank God, <laughs> because it was a very unique situation, you know, that we work 12 hour shifts mm -hmm. and I was able to build stuff while I was working. So my advice, you know, so now, yes, I'm a nurse. So now my projects are my patient, right? Um, I would definitely say that gives you a lot of flexibility that the average person doesn't have from working nights to working weekends, whatever the situation is. Um, so I guess from that perspective, not being afraid to maybe step away from that institution that you've been affiliated with for years and going on and doing private duty work or on-call work at various hospitals that are near your sites. Um, the good thing about nursing is you can go to, you know, one day a week, one day a month, and that's pretty much what I had, do had done. So to her question, you know, there's so much out there, but I really would try to sop up as much information as you can by yourself, on your own, online, so that when you do approach people to talk about different things that you're interested in, they can give you some really great advice, you know, learn about what you need uh, financially to start a project. You didn't really say what market you were interested in. I don't know if it was affordable housing or, or private projects, but um, definitely you're in a great position, believe it or not, being a nurse, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Erica, John, did you want to add? I think that, um, I think, Alexis having that background just gave really great advice about how to transition, right? Because that's what it would be about transitioning and having that flexibility. I think, again, it's important to zone in on what is the area of interest through the research. And there's just so much, you know, we are information laden now, you know, there's so many, so many ways to get information. So I think it's zoning in on what aspect of the real estate industry is interesting to you. And then, you know, um, thinking about what are the ways in which you can transition into it, given your training and the flexibility that your profession allows? So I think that was really great <laughs> advice. 
I agree with them. Um, when I initially did it, I did a lot of research, um, as I said before, through our discussions with um, local and state. I also reached out to have an parent that worked in government. Mm -hmm. uh, they also helped me um, and suggest I reached out to different governmental agencies. Um, and I was just very blessed where the women were willing to talk to me. Um, and then I just, from that, identified some key areas and I try to find a niche for myself um, based upon those key areas. But it's, it was also based upon you know, prior experience, I believe that we're, what they say, we're some of all our experiences. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to find something to you um, with all my experiences to really shine. Um, but once again, I didn't do anything like nursing, but I did. It was coming from the South to New York. It, you know, it was a lot of research I had to do because I wanted to make sure I can succeed here in New York. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to just, uh, it's seven o'clock, and so it's that time to close our panel um, for our Zoom audience. Let me come over here so I can be in view of the camera. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, um, so our Zoom audience doesn't think there's some random ghost person talking. But um, I want to thank so much, uh, Tyra, all of the members on your panel. I want to thank, um, Oh my God, Christine, I'm sorry. And I want to thank all the members of our panel. So if everyone and both audiences can please give our panel a round of applause. Thank you. 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 Thank you